Okay, I'm going to mute everybody if you forgive me for doing that. And we're going to begin with our summaries as we do every single time. Um, it's Parshas Ki Tavo. When you'll come to the land, the word Tavo means you'll come. When you'll come to the land, these are the mitzvahs that you will do. So the summary, we begin by talking about Bikurim, which is a very exciting mitzvah that the farmer would bring the very first fruits of his labor and he'd bring it to the Beit HaMikdash and he had to say a whole long um, presentation of gratitude. This was a magnificent um, wording of, of, of gratitude and care and, and, and wanting to acknowledge that Hashem has given us all these gifts. So then we, we explain that it only applies to certain commandments, like to certain fruits, like Eretz Chita Usora, Gefen Utei Nabri it's the seven species with which Israel is blessed. These are the amazing species that um, are separated and uniquely um, important. In fact, there are special brachas that apply specifically to these um, produce of, of, uh, of Israel. So it only applies to these kinds of foods and, and, and it only applies to those that were grown in Israel itself. The owner makes a recite a whole Thanksgiving prayer. We'll go into it because it goes back all the way in history. It's not just what is happening in the moment. There's an acknowledgement of what preceded him. Then the Jewish farmers are required to separate several different tithes. There were a lot of separatings that had to take place. It was, for example, Truma, which was either 40th or 50th or 60th that was given to the Kohen. Then there was a tithe that was given to the Levi. There was also a tithe, a second tithe, that either on certain years had to be eaten uh, in Yerushalayim. If, if it wouldn't last that long, then you would redeem it on money. And then when you'd get to Jerusalem, you would buy produce in Yerushalayim. Two of the, two of the years of the cycle of seven where the second tithe was given to the poor. So there was a, a whole number of um, tithes that the farmer was responsible to give. They were given to the Kohanim and the Levim and to the poor, depending on which tithe it was. Some of it, one tithe, as we said, Ma'asar Sheni, the second tithe, had to be eaten by the owners in Yerushalayim or redeemed in the food eaten in Yerushalayim. Then there had to be a special declaration that took place. And that was the farmer would say, Bi'arti hakodesh min habayit. I fulfilled all my tithing duties. And he asked Hashem to bless his people and the land. So there was actually a declaration that I have done all that was required of me. I've given the tithes that were necessary. Change subjects. Moshe Rabbeinu reminds the Jewish people to observe all of Hashem's commandments. That they had selected Hashem to be their God. And he in turn had chosen them to be his holy and treasured nation. This is a reciprocal relationship where Hashem has uniquely chosen us for, for responsibilities and we have chosen Hashem to be a part of our lives. Then we are told to gather large stones as we cross the Jordan River, which was to go into Israel. This was under Joshua's leadership. And these stones were to be plastered and the entire Torah was to be engraved upon them. Another set of stones inscribed with the entire Torah was to be set up on Har Eval. These are two mountains just across the border, having crossed the Jordan. Uh, the Jewish people were instructed to proclaim blessings and curses on Har Grizim and Har Eval. When, when you go to Israel today, um, there's actually a, uh, two mountains opposite one another, and the one is filled with uh, foliage and very lush, um, and the other one is very barren. And we'll see that each of these mountains were associated, was associated with other blessings, so the other one was curses, and it actually impacted on the mountain themselves. The elders of the Levim, together with the Holy Ark, stood in between the two mountains. Six of the tribes were stationed atop on each mountain, six on this mountain, across the valley, six on the other mountain. The Levim and Kohanim faced each of these mountains alternately, and they stated the blessings and the curses. Va'amru chal ha'am, amen. And then the nation would answer, Amen. So you had six tribes on this mountain, six tribes on that mountain, the Ark and the Levim in the middle, 
And there was a whole lot of proclamations of blessings and God forbid the opposite. And then we are told that bountiful blessings will shower us if we listen to Hashem's commandments. Now comes a section in Parshas Kisavoy. It only happens twice in the entire year, two weeks before the festival of Shavuot and two weeks before Rosh Hashanah. We have a section that describes in graphic detail the terrible possibilities of tragedy that could befall the Jewish people if we do not follow Hashem's mitzvot. And so much so, we'll come back to this point, the aliyot on this coming Shabbos, we don't call up anybody for that aliyah. It's normally the custom that the person reading the Torah reads the section without being called up because you don't want to call up a person and then he gets a cup full of all of these um, terrible descriptions. By contrast, if the Balkar, the person who's reading the Torah, just says the brachot, so we'll soon see that hidden in these curses, supposed curses, are many blessings as well. It's also read in an undertone and it's read very quickly. So if anyone's listening to Shmuel in Shul the Shabbos, you'll notice that when we get to this section, he's going to lower his voice, he's going to start going at a thousand miles an hour, and we go through the section very quickly. But in the section, a very serious, very serious possible uh, um, tragedies that could befall the Jewish people. And it's always read two weeks before Rosh Hashanah, because next week we have the portion, which is Nitzavim, which speaks about the Jewish people standing firm and strong and erect and, and being blessed by Hashem. So we don't go from this into Rosh Hashanah, but we put it a little bit before Rosh Hashanah so that it's a sobering reminder of what the possibilities of a human being is. There's the Mount Har Hargrizim and there's Har Eval, a mountain which is associated with blessing and then the mountain associated with, God forbid, the opposite of it. These are the two possibilities that always are in front of each of us. In fact, every moment of life. Then Moshe Rabbeinu reminds the Jewish people of all the miracles that took place during the Exodus when Hashem took us out of Egypt. Remember all of these uh, tremendous miracles and therefore it is incumbent upon us to follow Hashem's covenant because this is how Hashem invested in us, so we should follow the mitzvot that Hashem has given us. That's basically a summary of the whole parsha. And we always stop to take a try and take a whole lot of messages which are practical and which we can apply in our lives because the Torah is biblical, it goes back so many years, it's uh, historical, but most of important, it is Torah. Torah means instructive, Torah means a lesson. And all of us have to read each Shabbat's portion and read into it the instructions that are so relevant to our own lives. So it begins by saying you'll take of the first of the, all the fruit of the land. So this is a lesson how to express gratitude. You know, everyone knows that we should say thank you. It's one of our uh, very important ingredients of good manners. We say thank you when somebody does something. But here is not just a lesson that we ought to say thank you. It tells us how, how to say thank you. Because we are very specific in enumerating the details of that which we are grateful for. Sometimes when one just says something in a very generalized phrase, it doesn't carry the strength of detail. Details show that one is actually digesting the words, one is thinking about each of the words, the same thing applies to compliments. You know, when one gives a compliment to a child and says, you know, you're a great kid, or you, 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 that you, did, you did a wonderful job. It's certainly a good reinforcement, but it doesn't come close to saying to the person, you did a great job because of the way you spoke and these words that you said resonated so well. The detail, the detail shows that you're actually involved rather than just saying a generalized platitude. You're actually involved in what you're saying. So here we have a great lot of detail. Not only that, the details go back to Egypt. The farmer is standing in Israel thousands of years later, and he says, these fruits, the fruits that I'm holding in my hand in this basket, this began a long time ago. It began long before I was born. It began when my Jewish people were slaves in Egypt and Hashem, you redeemed us. That was the first seed of the success. It went even before that. Do you remember there was a man called Lavan and he tried to um, crook and cheat our forefathers? We go back to even those beginnings, like we do on the Seder night. We go back in time to the very beginnings because we see the context of our present success 
has to be seen in the broader context of the history of our people. Everything contributed to this moment. I recognize and I realize that it's not just me and it's not just what happened in the field last week or last season or over the course of this year. My parents, my grandparents, they invested so much that I could be, that I should be here today. My great, great parents, the chain goes back to Moshe Rabbeinu. It goes back to our parents in Egypt, it goes back to our forefathers. That is how we acknowledge the successes of our lives. And not only that, not only do we go back in time, we don't only go back to the success moments in our history, we go back to the tragic, sad moments of our history too. And we say those too contributed to my success. And this is going to resonate when we come back to the curses that we said uh, later on in the portion, that there is always a two track that happens even in what appears to be so sad and bad, there is something in those moments that also have the possibility, the seeds of hope and the promise of a better tomorrow. In fact, the prophet says, and these are words that I remember Chief Rabbi Harris, when he spoke just after Mandela was released, remember him standing in his talus and we were so proud the way he represented the Jewish community, and he quoted the words from Isaiah, including the words, Otcha Hashem ki anafta bi. I will thank you, Hashem, for those moments which it appeared that you had despised me, that you had um, been ang angered at me. I will thank you for those moments too. Because when we look back in time, it's easier to recognize that even the difficult moments had some kind of bearing on Jewish history ultimately in a positive way. One of the famous stories that is told in the Talmud is about Rabbi Akiva. And the, it's a famous story that Rabbi Akiva was traveling, he came to a certain town. When he came to the town, they said, no, no, we actually don't want you in our town. You want to see, you Jew, you want to, you want to stay, stay on the mountain. You, you know, we're not letting you into our town. There's no place, no place for you. Rabbi Akiva said, call mother Ovid Rahman al Taba Ovid. Whatever God does in this world, he does for good. And he goes and he sleeps on the mountain, not so comfortable, no shower, no, no hot food, no, no, no comforts, he was on the mountain. And then he takes out a candle and he lights a candle and he starts to learn Torah. Comes a wind and it blows out the candle. So now he's stuck on the side of the mountain and he can't learn Torah either. And what does he say? Call Mada Avid Rahman, whatever God does, Lataba it's for good. I don't, I don't see the good. I can't understand what good could be in, in Hashem taking away my possibilities of learning. But Hashem only does things that are ultimately for good. And then as he was uh, going to sleep, a, um, a, a, a fox came and ate his uh, chicken, which he had hoped would be his alarm clock in the morning. He always had a chicken with him because uh, this was the days before iPhones where we could have an alarm clock on the iPhone. They had a chicken. Now he didn't have a chicken. Now, I wasn't sure I was going to wake up in the morning. During the night, a wild cat comes and, and, and takes down his donkey. So now he is on the side of the mountain without a candle, without a rooster, without a donkey, without transport. It couldn't get worse. And on every occasion, he says the words, whatever God does is ultimately for good. And then it turns out that during the course of the night, uh, uh, marauding troops come through the city and they massacre the inhabitants of the city. And Rabbi Akiva was in darkness without any sound of any animal to, 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 to attract attention, is the only survivor on the side of the mountain. Whatever God does is for good. So Rabbi Akiva was able to very quickly see why all of his misfortune was in fact Hashem investing in him because there was a future for Rabbi Akiva. Now, it's not always so immediate. And sometimes pain is so extensive that it's impossible for us to even recognize and understand its deeper meaning, certainly in a generation. But we are here for no, so many generations. We are here for thousands of years. When this farmer stood with his fruit, giving recognition to Hashem and expressing his uh, gratitude to Hashem, he says, Hashem, everything contributed to this. The dark moments of Egypt contributed to who I am. The happy moments, the sad moments, the, the biblical moments, the moments around that go back to our forefathers. All of this is relevant 
That is how we stand in front of Hashem every single day. We have to see ourselves in the context of a large chain that goes extensively back to the very origins of time. And then there's me. So can you imagine if I just decide to walk away? So much is dependent on me. And this is the message we need to give our children, our grandchildren, and the next generation. We matter so much because look how much has contributed to this moment of success. If I just walk away and I pretend that this is not significant, or I don't express my gratitude, so much of history is on my shoulders to continue the path of our people. That is how we say thank you. That is how we express gratitude. Now, it says that you'll take of the first of all your fruits of the land. The Rambam, Maimonides in his code says, that everything that is for the sake of Hashem has to be of the most beautiful and of the best. So if we live in beautiful homes, then our shul should look more beautiful than our finest homes. If we have magnificent bathrooms at home, the mikveh should have a bathroom that puts our personal um, bathroom to shame. That is how beautiful it should be. Our attitude should be that whatever we're using for Hashem should be of the best. If we're buying to fill in, it should be the best fill in. If we're having a lulav and etrog, the best. Not that we have the finest car and the finest clothes and suits. And then when it comes to the mitzvah, we're saying, well, you know, this, do we really need this? I, I, why should I spend so much money? What's the difference between this lulav and this lulav? Because we don't know the difference. But we do know the difference between um, Gucci and, uh, and whatever it is. There, there we do know the difference because we, we, we're more seasoned in fashion. So Rambam says that what the best, as we say, whenever one designates something for a holy purpose, he should sanctify the finest of his possession. As it says in Vayikra, the choice should go to Hashem. Everything of the greatest, the best should be for Hashem. So it's an attitude switch that what we're doing for our spiritual development has to be the finest and the best. You know, sometimes even in a mitzvah of Hachnasat or Chimen, we'll come back to this point. When we invite a guest into our home, we're not sure which whiskey to take out. Now, when I'm on my own, or I'm on a Zoom call, it's amazing. When I'm having a lechaim with my friends on a Zoom call, we all take out our best whiskey. You know, 25 year old is rare because no, nobody's nobody's diminishing the, the the quantity. I'm just drinking on my own. When it comes to the house is full, I bring out my my simple bells. You know, I'm not going to have my my best whiskey being diminished over here. It should be the reverse. If you have guests in our home, the finest food, the best food. For myself, it doesn't really matter. But if I'm doing a mitzvah, the mitzvah should have the best and the finest. And that we see from this first fruit, that Hashem is not just saying bring fruit. The first of your fruit. It's, 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 a, it's an incredible statement of the farmer. He's worked hard. He's been on his tractor every morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, as former farmers do. And then he finally gets the fruit. And the first fruit, before he partakes of everything, is thinking Hashem. It's, it's an attitude switch. It's, it's a mindset that is completely different. We don't live in embellishing our own successes and seeing how much it's relevant to me. I'm constantly thinking about what do I actually owe for all of this bounty that I, all the successes of my life. It's a different mindset. Now, I always try and show that a mitzvah should always be seen in the context. Where is it presented? And we have an interesting juxtapositioning that we have the first fruit and this mitzvah of bringing the first fruit to the Kohen and expressing our gratitude comes immediately after the end of last Shabbat's reading, which talks about the nation of Amalek, that there is a nation of Amalek and Zachor, remember this nation, they tried to attack us in the desert and remember them and destroy the nation of Amalek. And then comes the story of Bikurim. What's the connection? So the simple explanation is that the first of the fruits is Bikurim. And the nation of Amalek was described, or is described in mine and Alan Sassoon's Bar Mitzvah Pasha, Reshit Goyim Amalek, the first nation that attacked the Jewish people was Amalek, the first. So we have the first fruit and the first nation. So the first, we see that there's a correlation of first, but we need something more profound than that. It's not just because there's a word. This is a first of fruit and this is a first of enemies. So if we look a little bit deeper, the nation of Amalek, 
we are told asher karcha baderech, simply translated, they chanced upon you on the road. But we know that the word karcha, especially according to the teachings of Hasidus, means from the word kar in Hebrew. They cooled us off. The nation of Amalek is a nation that had to be destroyed, but the concept of Amalek, how do we relate to it today? What is Amalek in your and my life today? And there has to be a relevance today. Amalek is that force, that energy inside of ourselves that's constantly cooling off the passion. So every time we start getting excited about a mitzvah, about something spiritual, it cools us off. In fact, the Hebrew word Amalek is, has the same numerical value of the Hebrew word for doubt, which is safek. A safek, a doubt, is a terrible thing. A doubt means that you constantly, every time you think that you have a, a way forward, maybe not, who says, how do you know? Casting doubt, it cools off even the most passionate person, enthused and excited about doing a mitzvah, get cooled off. That is what our Malik tried to do with us. And when, when all the tremendous miracles were happening all around us, when God was found in our midst in such a profound, relevant daily experience, the manna from heaven, the seas being split, everything was happening around us. In the midst of that, Amalek comes along and says, maybe not God. Amalek tried to take God out of the miracle. What, what seems to be an explicit expression of God, Amalek comes along and says, maybe not. So how do we respond to a voice inside of ourselves that diminishes God in the miracle, even in the miracle? Maybe not. Maybe we don't have to. So the response to the energy of trying to extract God from the miracle is to emphasize God in nature. That, that's the best response. Not only will I be passionate about the miracle and accept that God is the source of the miracle, I will show that God is the source of everything that had, takes place in the supposedly natural world. The Bikurim, the first fruits that I worked for, that I put all my energy into, that comes from Hashem. That's my response to Amalek. You want to cool me off, not to recognize Hashem in the miracle. I will recognize Hashem in the natural. That's my response. And that's why the two are juxtapositioned next to one another immediately after the instruction to remember the dangers of Amalek as a nation and, a, and the responsibility to wipe out the nation. That was what Shaul Amalek had to do and didn't succeed in doing. And we know that Purim's story was a descendant of Amalek, Haman. And Amalek represents the evil of, of, of terrorism, of, of trying to, 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 to kill the weak stragglers, those who, who, who are not able to protect themselves. But it also represents a theme in our own lives. The Amalek inside of ourselves is an energy that constantly is cooling us off from being passionate. And we respond by being passionate, not only in the miracle, but even in the natural order. That is why the Kurim follows Amalek. Now, a final point about this beautiful mitzvah of Bikurim is that it says, Valakacha Kohen, Hatene, Miyadecha, the Kohen will take the basket of the fruit, Miyadecha, from your hands. So the question is, why does it have to say that the Kohen will take it from our hands? Why are, why are our hands mentioned? Why doesn't it just say, give the Kohen, or the Kohen will take it? Why does it say you'll take it from your hands? Etatene Miyadecha, from your hands, actually in plural. Take it from your hands. So Hasidus explains that there is a very clear hierarchy of limbs in the human body. When Hashem created the human being, he put us in an order. And the order is that our head is on top. Not by mistake. Heads could have been at the bottom. Hashem could have worked out a way that a head, the anatomy of a person would be the head and the bottom, but he didn't. The head is on top and underneath the head is the heart. And underneath the heart are the functional limbs because that's how we operate. That is how we have to operate. Head, mind on top. We have to have a head that says, Shema Yisrael, the meditation. Think about the fact that God is our God, the only force, the only source, the uniting force of the entire universe. And after one has had the meditation of thought, comes the feelings. And you'll love the Lord your God. And after that comes the fulfillment through all of the mitzvahs 
that you put them on the signs on your doorpost, you put on tefillin, the mitzvahs that come afterwards. It is mind, heart, and then the functionally rim, limbs of the body. And we stand upright because that is how we have to be. In fact, I don't want to get into the whole subject in itself, a whole share. The mind is in Hebrew, mem, which stands for moach, and the heart is lev, and the functionally limbs is represented by the filtration of the liver. The liver filters the blood into the rest of the body, which is in Hebrew, chaf, for, for kaved. And the, those letters the, is an acronym of mem, lamed, chaf, which stands for the word melech. A melech is a king. We are kings in our lives if we know where tomorrow is going to be, when we can plan, when we know what our commitment is tomorrow, when we know how we're going to plan our day. Our mind dictates our feelings and our feelings dictate our actions. And there's a synchronized force. That is what's so important about the feeling, putting it on our head and our, next to our hearts and on our hands. I don't want to get completely sidetracked. But that is a hierarchy of limbs. That is now. Where do the hands belong? To get back to the point of hands, where in the human anatomy are the hands? So it's pointed out that the hands don't have a fixed place in the human anatomy, because the hands can be way above our heads. They can be right on top of us. Our hands can be underneath our feet, because that is the nature of a human being. The hands of a human being could be hayadaim yaday esav. We have a capacity to use our hands like Esau, to kill, to maim, to hurt. And we also have the hands of a Kohen that stretches out his hands. This is how you will bless the Jewish people. Nesiat kapayim, the lifting up of our hands. Every time we wash our hands before we eat, we say a bracha al netilat yadai, because we are elevating our hands. And that's a very profound thought, that our hands don't have a fixed place because they are where we put them. Our hands can be higher than our heads, and our hands can stoop lower than the lowest. How do we use our hands? Do we use the hands of Esau? And that could be the Kohen taking the basket of fruit, looked at the hands and said, what kind of hands produced us? Were these the hands that elevated, that embraced, that assisted, that helped, that loved? Were those the kind of hands? Or were these the hands that pushed aside, that maimed, that isolated, that hurt? And when we produce the Bikurim of our lives, we have to know what kind of hands, what kind of actions have brought about the successes of our life. Very important. This I just noticed so recently when we're learning Rambam three chapters a day, and just recently we learned about the festivals, and it says that you will rejoice in the festival, Atava Halevi, you and the Levite, Vahageir Asher Bisharecha, and also the stranger in your gates will rejoice on Yontem. Maimonides, I just noticed this quote because it, it stuck in my head, that when one has a festive meal, meal a festival meal, when on Pesach and Shavuot and on Sukkot, and in the Samachta B'chagecha, and you'll be rejoicing in your festival, and you have a festive meal, the Ramam says, what's the ultimate festival meal? It's not that you have caviar, and you have the finest steaks, and you have the best cut that you could possibly get at the butcher store and you have the finest wine. Yeah, all of that contributes to a great meal. But what really contributes to the meal is do we feed the stranger and the orphan and the widow and the other unfortunate paupers? Is our table graced with the people who are in need? And then the Ramam says something very harsh. That is how we define a festive meal because otherwise it is the joy of the stomach. Simchas Kreisoy. This is the joy of the stomach. So you've had a good time. You've had a good meal? Great. You enjoyed yourself on Yontav? Wonderful. It's a, it's a mitzvah. But that's a, the joy of your own stomach. The real joy? The real joy is that you have somebody at your table sharing who is in need. That's the real joy of Yontav. To give and to share. A very, very beautiful quote from the Laws of Festivals, which we just did recently, and it's based on this verse in our portion that we have to share our festive meal with a stranger and with those. Reb Shimshon of Fall Hirsch points out and says that Hayyim Hazer, this day, Niyesalaam, you've become a people. And Shimshon of Fall Hirsch points out and says, When did we become a people? 
people become people when they get independence, when they have a country, when they have uh, an acknowledgement of their culture, when they, they recognize them in the United Nations, that's when people get very excited that, they, that they're now a country. So Rav Shem Shafur Hesh says, Hayom Hazen Yesalam, when? When did we become a people? Uniquely, our nationhood was forged not by land. We didn't have a land. We were still in the desert. It wasn't even established by language or, or by culture. All of the corner posts of nationhood. It was established on the day in which the Jewish people pledged to uphold the Torah. When we accepted upon ourselves our responsibility to Hashem, Hayom Hazer, that's the day, we became a people. Our people was forged in a commitment to godliness, to Hashem's mission, to be the children and the servants of Hashem. And it was specifically at a time when we did not have a land and we didn't have a language, didn't have a culture. We had the commitments to Hashem. Very quick point about Reb Bunim of Pshischa. We've we, we had a number of quotes from him, but he says, Baruch Ata Ba'ir, Baruch Ata Basadeh. Blessed are you in the city, and blessed are you in the field. So a little bit similar to what we've quoted about the Rambam and the uh, festival of the stomach. He says that blessed are you in the city. There's a context, there's a surrounding of your blessing. Blessed are you in the field, there's a context. You're not alone. You want to know what blessing is? In other words, don't be a tzaddik in pelts. This whole concept of a tzaddik in pelts is that there are different ways that a person can warm themselves when they're cold. One way is to put on a fur coat and you're no longer cold. Another way is to light a fireplace and then feed the fire. It takes much more effort. You've got to chop the wood and you've got to make sure that the chimney is clear and then you have a fire. What's the difference? The tzaddik in a fur coat resolves the problem by only addressing his own self. He hasn't addressed the environment. But the tzaddik who looks to in increase the heat and the warmth for everyone in the room, that is a totally different level, level of tzaddik. Now we're warm not just for ourselves, we're warm for everybody. So Rebunia Pshiska says, the goodness should be influence your surroundings in the city and in the field. So if you are blessed, Baruch Atah, Ba'ir, see your blessing in the context of your city. How are you sharing? How are you influencing? How is your blessing going to somehow impact on the environment of the city? Baruch Atah, Ba'asadeh. Blessed are you in the field. How is the field, the, 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 the source of sustenance, going to be impacted by your blessing? And blessing in isolation is not a proper blessing. A blessing has to be within the context of city and field. And there's a message for all of us that our own blessings, our achievements and successes in life should not be in isolation. It shouldn't be the fur coat variety. It should be the fireplace variety. If we have blessings, how are we sharing? How are we giving? How is this impacting on things around us? I mentioned before that there's the section this week that talks about some very harsh realities of our history. It is, the words are horrific. When you read them, you think that like, really Hashem, that there should be so much suffering, that there should be pain, that this is how parents are gonna have to deal with the loss of children and, and hunger and starvation and, and, and pestilence and terrible, terrible, um, horrific curses. And the story is told that the young Reb Dov Bear was ultimately going to be the next Rebbe after the Alter Rebbe, who wrote the Shulchan Aruch Harav and who wrote the Tanya, when he was a little child, his father was out of town and somebody else read the Torah that year, this parsha, this section that talks about all of these terrible curses. And he fainted. Not only did he faint, he became seriously ill, so ill that there was a question whether he'd be allowed to fast on Yom Kippur. He was still before Bar Mitzvah, but there were preparing him to fast for Yom Kippur. From Parshas Kisova, there's still a second week of Natsavim before Rosh Hashanah, and then another 10 days to Yom Kippur. He became so ill that for weeks, so ill that it weren't even sure if he could fast on Yom Kippur. And they came to, they said, what, what, what were you, what, what happened this year? It's never happened before. 
So they asked him, don't you hear this rebuke? Every year, this parsha, last year, you heard the same reading and nothing happened. And he said, when my father reads these words, one doesn't hear the curses. So what this is saying is that hidden in the curses of the Torah is not a God of vengeance, not a God who's God forbid wanting to eradicate his people. There is a huge relationship between Hashem and his people, even in the tragic moments of our history. When we talk about Tisha B'Av and the fact that there is a specific day in the year that is so associated with tragedy, we mention it over Tisha B'Av. It's Ikri Mo'ed. Even Tisha B'Av is called a meeting point with Hashem because we believe that God did not discard us and didn't throw us into the wind and it isn't a wanton act in which there is no design and no purpose. The fact that all of the tragedies in life, in history, happened on Tisha B'Av, the first temple, the second temple, the, the Crusades, the, the sec, first crusade, the second crusade, the expulsion of the Inquisition, the first world war, all of these terrible events happen on the same day means that there's a relationship, even in our pain and suffering. And whilst we cannot understand on the surface and the simple meaning of the words, how this could be anything but wrong, bad, terrible. Somehow, the discerning eye knows that Hashem never cast us away. And even in the greatest pain, He is still relating to us as a child. Sometimes the father moves back from the child, almost like when a child is starting to walk. And the child is so excited to take the few, few steps towards the father. And as he's reaching the father, the father takes another few steps back. And the child is probably thinking, Father, I worked so hard to take these few steps towards you. Why did you take a step back? Why? Don't you love me? Don't you care for me? Look how hard I'm working to get to you. And the father's only intention is that the child should learn to walk. When Hashem puts us through all of these terrible events of our history, it was never out of discarding, taking anger, vengeance, Hashem getting his own back. God forbid. Hashem loves us. He's a father. And a child goes through pain and suffering. It is ultimately because Am Yisrael is, is going to reach through all of the suffering and be redeemed. And there is going to be a Mashiach. And there is going to be a redemption. And the Shana Babi Rushalayim. All of our tragedies are also contributing to some purpose and good that is ultimately going to uh, arrive. We don't always see it. And Alta Rebbe read the words. He was reading the words on the level of Hashem's embrace of the Jewish people, even in our pain and suffering. We don't necessarily see it. When we read the words, we can't understand how that could possibly come from a place of, 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 of a concerned relationship. But the deeper understanding of Hashem's ways which we struggle and often only see in retrospect, when we look back a hundred years or a thousand years, we can understand how such suffering led, and, and sometimes the worst times, oh, Lynette, we're sharing your screen. I don't know how to get rid of this. Oh, wow. Um, uh, So um, we have uh, a recognition that even in the most difficult, painful events of our life, there is a purpose and a meaning. And that is how we read the Tachacha on a deeper level, knowing that Hashem didn't throw us to the wind and doesn't discard us. He loves us. And finally, a point that I want to make about um, the Tochacha ends off and says, Tachas asher lo yobadetes Hashem lekecha v'simcha uvetob leivav. And all of these terrible things will come upon you as a people because you did not serve Hashem. And then it adds the words, with happiness and with gladness of heart in abundance of everything. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies. So it doesn't say all of this is happening because you didn't serve God. It adds a few more words. All of these terrible things could befall the Jewish people because you didn't serve God with happiness and goodness of heart. Says Maimonides, even though you served God, you didn't serve God with joy. That is the source of your affliction. It's not good enough to serve Hashem. 
there has to be a joy in our serving of Hashem. You know, when we turn to our kids and we say the words, oh, it's so hard to be a Jew, but I'm still a Jew anyway, even though it's so hard, even though it's so difficult. If that's the message we give our kids, it's the biggest turnoff. Who wants to be part of something that is associated with negativity and suffering? The person should be telling our kids, it's a joy to be a Jew. It's a privilege to be a Jew. Like, uh, this is the most unbelievable gift that we've been given to be the children of Hashem. That is how we should speak. We shouldn't talk about how heavy the burden is. And we should do it with joy. And Hasidus explains that there is no sin in the Torah that you cannot be depressed. There is no. It does say, Ibdu at Hashem b'simcha. There's a positive commandment to serve Hashem with joy. But there is no negative prohibition. Thou shalt not be depressed. Notwithstanding the fact that there isn't one of the 613 commandments a negative prohibition about being depressed, Hasidah says that the spiritual damage which comes out of melancholy and depression is worse than the worst avera than we can do. Worse than the worst sin. When we sin and we do something wrong, it's an event, it's a mistake, it's a weakness. We can address it tomorrow. But if we allow ourselves to reach a point that we don't have hope and we don't have the possibilities of a better tomorrow, the mood is pervasive. It's not just an event, a detail, an action that has to be repaired. Something has to happen to change the way we're thinking, the way we behave, the way we're feeling. This is pervasive. It doesn't state that thou shalt not be depressed, but depression is the greatest cause of detachment and sin. Who wants to get out of bed when we're depressed? And obviously there are people who are ill and that need to be medicated and, and thank God Hashem gives medicine to the world for physical illnesses and then there are mental illnesses and there are illnesses that relate to emotional things and, and one has to get help. So I'm not talking about people who need assistance and help because then this is not a judgment call. This is about uh, getting help like any other person who's ill. And, 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 and depression is an illness. You, know, you can't just say to a person, pull yourself together. It is an illness. But there is so much in the course of our day that we can, by changing our attitude, by having this attitude of gratitude, by recognizing that our successes are from Hashem, by realizing that we have a relationship with Hashem, by constantly remembering that we are children of Hashem. These are ingredients that allow us not to fall into melancholy. And I've told you so, so many times that my famous teacher in Krachabad, my teacher whom I loved so dearly, Rebendel Futafas, he always used to say, if guilt, if you lose money, but when God is you haven't really lost anything. Yes, you've lost money and it's, it's difficult. Financial loss is, is painful. But you haven't really lost anything of life. If you lose health, you've lost half because now you don't have the strength to be able to do what you need to do. It's the same word in Yiddish and Afrikaans. If you lose hope, then you've lost everything. To lose money, so we can manage in a different level of, of, uh, of scale of economies. And, and there's different ways that we can find solutions to financial loss. If we lose health, that's problematic. So we've lost something that is affecting our lives. To lose hope, to lose hope means that we put ourselves in a dark place that doesn't allow us to extricate ourselves from there. This whole portion spoke about gratitude. It spoke about appreciation about seeing ourselves in the context of something broader, not seeing our success only as what we did today or yesterday or this year or this lifetime. We come from somewhere and we are a continuation of something. We are a link in a chain. If that is how we read our successes, then that is how we will also read the moments that are not so successful. We're not alone. We're not just here for the moment. We are a continuum of something much greater than the moment. And if that is how we look at every single day of our lives, we have the power and the strength to look forward with optimism and with hope and looking forward to a Shana to a year ahead of us that is filled with health and with strength and with sweetness 
revealed sweetness. Everything we said from Hashem is only meant for good. When we ask Hashem to give us a good and sweet year, we're saying, Hashem, we know that it's good. Whatever comes from you ultimately is good. But let it be the kind of good that is sweet, that we can taste, that we can actually see with our own eyes today how good it is. Thanks for joining, guys. Great to have you Thank with you us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Basil. Nice to have Aviva with us. Bye, Peter. Good to see you. Bye. 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 Nice to see you. Okay, thank you. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Helen, nice to see you. Annette, all of the people that I didn't see beforehand. Thank you for joining.